Joel chapter 3, a little book that is perhaps the most understudied book uh, in the Bible, and yet critical for prophecy. Now, the, uh, after chapter 1 and, and, and setting the stage with this locust invasion and so on, in chapter 2 we had a, just a list of the events that would be forthcoming. The Gentile invasion of Armageddon, the destruction of the invaders, the repentance of Judah, the response of Yorivave, and uh, the effusion then of the Holy Spirit, this passage that gets so misunderstood because it's alluded to by uh, Peter in Acts chapter 2. But uh, it's not a fulfillment yet. It's just the beginning of that kind of giving of the Spirit. And uh, then verses uh, 30 to 32, the return and establishing the kingdom. And that's where we closed last time. The last two topics to undertake here is the judgment of the nations that follows and the full kingdom blessing, which will be our topics tonight. And so it's, it's chapter 3 in our English Bible. It's chapter 4 in the Hebrew Bible. That's a subtlety. In the Hebrew Bible, the passage we're looking at will be chapters, chapter 4, 21 verses. But no prophet of the Old Testament has more important revelation of the end times especially than Joel in this third chapter. We've had a lot in chapter 2, but chapter 3 is the wrap-up. The day of the Lord, of course, is the period of time that pervades this uh, early book, the book of Joel. And uh, it's the period of time from the tribulation, the great tribulation, that Jesus himself labeled. The last three and a half years of the 70th week of Daniel, labeled by the Lord himself, is the period of the great tribulation. From the great tribulation to the passing away of the heavens and the earth is what the scripture uh, calls the day of the Lord. The day of man, he's had his day. And uh, the result of that is the great tribulation and that mess. And it would, if, if it wasn't for the intervention by the return of the Lord himself, all flesh would be saved, uh, would be uh, 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 destroyed. And, uh, and the key passages from last time, Psalm 2, Zechariah 12 and 14, and of course Matthew 25. Uh, don't confuse the premillennial judgment of the sheep and the goats um, uh, with the great white throne judgment that occurs at the end of the thousand years. Study both of them. They're very distinct, uh, distinctly different. But the judgment of the Gentiles is the subject of our first 17 verses here in chapter 3. And uh, this follows Israel's national salvation. And then uh, now God will turn to the Gentiles. And verse 8 1 to 8 is the judgment of the Gentiles, and from 9 to 13, the beginning and the end of Armageddon. So let's take a look at this. Joel will be dealing with a time uh, for the, uh, where the Gentiles, in which he's pouring out his wrath. And for Israel, it's a restitution to glory and blessing. And let's look at Israel from the time of Joel to today, just in summary form. The diaspora Jew... He endured the tor torture of the Spanish Inquisition, the stench of the European ghettos, the sword of the Russian pogroms, the heel of Nazi annihilation. Israel was warned of these uh, if he, they were to be disobedient. You'll find that in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 4 and 28. And uh, in fact, Jeremiah calls at the time of Jacob's, Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah 30, uh, verse 7 and Zechariah 14, 2, and so forth. Uh, uh, Israel is warned of these things. Well, let's jump in and see what Joel says here. He says, For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. Notice that phrase, in those days and in that time. Many, many prophets subsequent to Joel will say, in that time, referring to the time that Joel is defined as the, uh, the, the day of the Lord. The regathering of Israel is a prerequisite of the end times. That's what's so significant about the time in which we live. We've seen Israel reemerge as a nation, and a regathering is taking place, a prelude to all of this. But there's two-thirds of the population are going to be killed. In Zechariah 13.8, it makes that point. And um, I read that scripture on the radio and was uh, labeled as an anti-Semite by the... Uh, Jewish Anti-Defamation League. No, I just read what Zechariah said, that two out of three are going to be um, killed in this final um, uh, period. Half of Jerusalem will be taken captive. 
And that's all in Zechariah 12. Uh, excuse me, Zechariah 14, verse 2. Zechariah 12, 13, and 14 has a lot to say about the end times. You want to always accompany your study of these passages with the parallel passages to get a full perspective. Second verse. God says, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now this term, valley of Jehoshaphat, is a much discussed term. It, we, this is the only place it appears. So there's a lot of scholastic guesswork going on here. It's an untranslated word which means Yahweh judges or Jehoshaphat judges. And uh, it's the only mention in the scripture. Uh, in the Targum it's rendered uh, the plane of division. So see it may be an idiomatic term rather than a specific ge identifiable geographic place. It may be idiomatic, not literal, in the minds of many. And Zechariah 12 and 14 would tend to support that kind of perspective. The Valley of Jehoshaphat. There are some that believe it's the Baraka Valley, west of Tekoa, east of, uh, of the road to Hebron. Um, that's where God defeated the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Edomites on behalf of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. So that's why they think of it as the Valley of Jehoshaphat. So if you identify it with the king by that name, that could be a possibility in 2 Chronicles 20. There are others that believe it's a label of being applied to the Kidron Valley. That valley just to the east of Jerusalem that lies between Mount Zion and the uh, 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 Mount of Olives. And that's a tradition that goes all the way back to Eusebius' time, 4th century. Uh, and, and so uh, this is also the view that's favored by Arnold Fruchtenbaum, and I respect him so profoundly as a Hebrew scholar, so uh, that's not to be dismissed. But it's not necessarily uh, near Jerusalem, despite because of a number of other passages. Uh, some even suggest it relates to Mount Carmel. Zechariah mentions the opening a very large valley when the Lord's feet touched Mount of Olives. This perhaps is a, a more defendable view, because we do know there's going to be huge topological changes when the Lord, his feet touch the Mount of Olives. It's going, to, they're going to, it's going to split in two. There's going to be a huge valley. That might be the valley that then is used for the judgment here. These are all speculations and uh, it's an unresolved area. But in any case, the nations are going to be judged for their conduct during the Great Tribulation. And that's the strange sheep and goat judgment that's described in Matthew. When you study the sheep and goat judgment, to be sensitive, there's three people. There's sheep and goat, and they're, they're separated in terms of how they treated the, the people that the Lord calls my brethren. And, and, and uh, in view of the, the focus of the Great Tribulation, that's taken to be, of course, uh, Israel. Uh, uh, and Because remember, our king of kings is Jewish. He's a Jewish king. And... Uh, Feinberg also points out, little do nations realize how they incur the wrath of God when they lay violent hands upon his heritage and the plant of his choosing, which of course is Israel. Whenever we mess around in the Middle East in our foreign policy, we run the risk of poking our finger in the eye of God. And uh, there's a very personal relationship between the Lord and the people he calls my people. He just says that three times, the Ami of of uh, Hosea 2 and so on. The Gentiles partition his land. You keep hearing about that all the time. The audacity of the UN, the audacity of our present administration that they would encourage the participation, uh, the, uh, the partition of, uh, of that, that land which the Lord has set aside for Israel. And uh, he talks about the Lord's partitioning and the institution of the year Jubilee in Le Leviticus 25. The Lord apportioned each tribe, their nachala, or their portion. The Gentiles' uh, crime is they're dividing it up for themselves. That's exactly what's going on. And uh, it's not succeeding. They're not getting agreement. And I think uh, uh, they have no grasp at how, th how directly offensive this is to the God of the Bible. Verse 3, and they have cast lots for my people. They have given a boy for a harlot and have sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Those are common atrocities during wartime. And that, of course, is dealt with all through the scripture, especially in uh, Obadiah and Zechariah 14 and so on. 
It's interesting how Josephus records in his War of the Jews and also in Antiquities, and it's also recorded in First and Second Maccabees. The Romans chose the tallest and most beautiful and reserved them for the tri triumph, the triumphal entry for them when they took them to Rome. Now, as for the rest of the multitude they, that were above 17 year, years old, he put them into bonds and sent them to the Egyptian mines. Those that were under 17 of age were sold for slaves. So that was the Roman resolution of all these things. Let's get to verse 4. Yea, and what have ye to do with me, O Tyre and Sidon, and all the coasts of Palestine? Will ye remember me a recompense? And if ye recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? <laughs> Whoa. Tyre and Sidon. This is an area that we know today as Lebanon. And it's, of course, controlled by the Hezbollah as an enemy of Israel. And uh, the term Palestine is actually a translation of Philistia. It's, that's the, uh, the Latin term for uh, the Palestina, if you will, is what we know as the Philistia. And, and in modern terms, that's the Gaza Strip, which, of course, today is controlled by the Hamas. You've got the Hezbollah to the north, you've got the Hamas uh, to the southwest of Israel. See, the lands of the Phoenicians and Philistines were given to Israel as an inheritance in Joshua 13. And, but J Israel was instructed to drive these people from the land, but they failed to do so. That's in Judges 1 and elsewhere. It's interesting that Israel's failure to follow through then, still to this day, haunts them. And uh, they've been a thorn in the side of Israel ever since. God told them what to do, and they didn't follow directions. The Philistines warred against Israel from Samson day, Samson's day until the uh, days of Joel. The last recorded invasion was against King Joram and his family, and, and only Jehoahaz, the youngest son, survived. We talked about that uh, last time, 2 Chronicles 21. And uh, God's saying, what are you to me? You know, what do we have in common? All the grievances committed upon God's people he considers as done to himself. Our God is indeed Jewish. That sounds strange to many ears, but that's the essence of what God is proclaiming here. You understand that in God's eyes, it's Israel and all the nations. They don't, he doesn't regard Israel as one of the nations. We tend, of course, to think of a whole list of nations and Israel is one of them. Not in God's eyes. There's Israel, his focus, his chosen people, through whom he entered human, uh, uh, humankind and, uh, to, in order to provide our, uh, for our uh, 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 salvation and restoration. So he, he teach, treats Israel separately, and then there's the nations, those guys, all through the Scripture. He says, what have you got, what have you got in common with me? Well, how about you and me? What do we have in common with him? Are we, do we really have a perspective that's consistent with the way God sees things? Are his priorities our priorities? Ooh. Verse 5, Because ye have taken my silver and my gold and have carried it into your temples and my goodly present things, my is there three times, taken my silver, my gold, so forth. And uh, just like in Hosea 2 and Haggai also in Haggai 2. Those treasures went to Babylon. The Persians gave them back, but they are presently in the Vatican, in Rome. The children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have ye sold unto the Grecians, that ye might remove them far from their border. Ezekiel 27 highlights the trade relationship between Phoenicia and Greece, Yavan in the, in the Bible, uh, Greece, <coughs> Meshech, and Tubal, Turkey as we would think of it. Greece had acquired 1,330,000 slaves. It has been said that 10,000 slaves per day were sold at Delos. Hmm. This is all prohibited by the brotherly covenant between Solomon and Tyre's King Hiram. But that's ancient history. Tyre got its destruction. It took Nebuchadnezzar 13 years to besiege Tyre and... Uh, he completely destroyed and enslaved this people. A remnant of Tyre escaped to a small island offshore. 
for 240 years they survived until Alexander the Great made history by building his famous causeway out to it from the mainland in 332 B.C. So there's a lot about Tyre that was predicted in the Bible that history has confirmed. That's a whole study in its own. I encourage you to undertake. Ezekiel's prophecy was fulfilled, Ezekiel 27. It was rebuilt, Matthew 15, Acts 21. But it was ultimately destroyed by the Muslims in 1291. Sidon is a sister city, and, uh, and Philistine uh, uh, also suffered the same fate as Tyre. The, uh, so... Behold, I will raise them up out of the place whither ye have sold them, and will return your recompense upon your own head. And uh, the Jews were destroyed and sold into slavery by Alexander the Great. And uh, he says, I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabians, to a people far off, for the Lord hath spoken it. So there's a reversal of the role of Phoenicians and Philistines who had sold Judah and Jerusalem to the Sabians. And so, and, what, and who are the Sabians? Well, generally uh, it's regarded as Sheba, southwest Arabia, uh, near Yemen in effect. Uh, some uh, uh, also point out the Bedouins came from Abraham and Keturah. Those are all related. And you can study those in Jeremiah 6 and Ezekiel 27 and 38 and so on. Now, one of the questions that some scholars figure that the, all this talk about Philistia and Phoenicia may prefigure Israel's enemies collectively. And they see that happens at, at Moab in Isaiah 25, and uh, also the whole story is about Edom in the book of Obadiah. That may be a very defendable academic view. I personally don't think so. I personally think that God means what he says, and they're very precisely, they're being used denotatively, not connotatively here. But that's just one person's opinion. Anyway, at that time, God's people will gain ascendancy over their foes, and that's the key part of this whole passage. Anyway, Isaiah 41, and you, go, you can look up the passages, especially the passages in Obadiah, Micah 7, and so on. Phoenicia, remember, is equivalent to Lebanon, and maybe even referring to Syria. Philistia, of course, is a term for the uh, uh, Philistines that came uh, from, Crete, uh, from Greece and... and, and uh, are, are, uh, 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 they tried to invade uh, Egypt, couldn't make it, so they settled on the west coast there and, uh, uh, in, uh, of Israel, and that's the Gaza Strip today, of course. Joel chapter 3, verses 4 to 8, is viewed by some as a peak episode that is uh, emphasized by what they call rhetorical underlining, or a height, a heightened vividness. There's a, there's a stylistic emphasis that uh, the scholars will point to there. It concentrates on specific participants in a courtroom-like atmosphere. In other words, God is talking to them, not about them. And that's one reason I think he's being specific. I don't tend to use those, uh, regard those labels connotatively. Some scholars do, and they may turn out to be right. The term vengeance is all through here, and that's a negative notion in Western thought. But it's a major theme that runs throughout Scripture. Uh, Psalm 137, uh, it's the, it, and it's the controlling idea in Obadiah and Nahum. In the New Testament, we see it in Revelation 6, 9 to 10. The justice of God demands that injustice of men and nations toward each other be redressed. However, while vengeance is a theme, vengeance belongs to God. We're not to take it into our own hands. That's not only Deuteronomy 32, it's Romans 12, and so on. Remember all through this that the apple of his eye is an identified group. It's called Israel. And uh, so Joel continues, Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Prepare war. That means, the term actually means sanctify a war. Declare a holy war. Wow. It's a dare. It's a call to arms. And uh, we find the same kind of uh, expressions in Obadiah 1 and Haggai 2. The same proclamation is in Revelation 16. The Antichrist is going to be responsible for gathering these armies together in the valley of Jezreel. Now, we know where that is. That's, that's what M Megiddo overlooks. And calling for a war against the Jews. And that's what we typically call the Armageddon campaign. The Antichrist will be the one precipitating all that. And, of course, it will be 
uh, uh, <laughs> unsuccessful. And uh, so this this all parallels the summoning of the people, summoning of the people to, of Judah to the temple. Same kind of language is being used. The destruction of the locusts in chapter one led to a general call to come for fasting and prayer. And when he did, the Lord relented and healed the land. There's a parallel here. The Judeans came together for repentance and are delivered. The nations now come for war with God and they are destroyed. And it's a war to the finish. This, Armageddon, is a war to the finish. And it's all echoed, by the way, in Psalm, uh, Psalm 2, where it's anticipated. Why do the heathen rage and imagine the vain thing? They take up arms against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us cast their cords from among us. And that it, it, Psalm 2 is, is a fu foundational piece here. Okay, let's continue here, Joel 3. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears and let the weak say, I am strong. That's in the exact opposite as it's usually quoted in Isaiah 2 verse 4 and Micah 4 3, where there they're to turn your swords into plowshares and your spears into pruning hooks. In other words, take your warfare weapons and convert them to useful things for peacetime. That's, that's the joyous quote of all of that. No, this is the inverse of that. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. See, Hosea is talking in, uh, in Hosea 2, he's talking about what happens after God's kingdom set up. That's when they convert their swords to plowshares and so forth. Joel is talking about what they do prior to God's setting up his kingdom. He says, and it's, it's, it's it, it, let the weak say, I am strong. It's not a necessity, it's just enthusiasm that is in, in being embraced here in the, in the passage. Let the weak say, I am strong. It's a dare. It's a dare. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathen. Gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Thy mighty ones. That's a term for warriors. Apparently refers to the angelic hosts who will assist God in this judgment. Compare that with Psalm 103, verse 20, Zechariah 14, 5, and other passages. These are the same warriors we saw in verse 9. They're also, again, I call your attention to Psalm 2, first few verses. My bet is on his. <laughs> Where's your bet? Let the heathen be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. There's that term, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. Some people equate it with Megiddo. For there I will sit down to judge all nations. I don't see it that way. I think, the, I think the, that Valley of Jezreel is where they assemble. They're going against Jerusalem. But in any case, there are uh, scholars that equate that with Megiddo. Because Megiddo is a real place. It sits on a tell or a hill about 70 feet high now as a result of being the site of 20 different cities over a 3,000 year period. And it's on the southwest end of the Carmel Mountain Range. Born, it borders on the Jezreel Valley, and you look across that valley, and you see Nazareth on the other side. Or turning around, if you, when Jesus was a boy in Nazareth, he could look out on that valley and see Megiddo on the other side. 22 miles wide at that point. And uh, it's the crossroads of the Middle East, north and south. Two trade routes meet there at the King's Highway in Via Maris. The Egyptians, the Persians, the Crusaders, the Druzes, the Turks, and Arabs have fought there. Deborah and Barak defeated the Canaanites there in Judges 4 or 5. Gideon defeated the Midianites there in Judges 7. Ahaziah slew Jehu there in 2 Kings 9. Josiah was killed by Pharaoh Necho of Egypt there in 2 Kings. And uh, also there's passages that relate to Edom and Judah, and Holy Court. And the harvest there is also alluded to in Revelation 14. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. These agricultural idioms really for a form of judgment. But these idioms change from war to harvest here. We see a harvest flavor to these idioms. That occurs all through the prophetic passages. The commands are in the plural, implying they're given to the warriors that we heard alluded to in verse 11. The agricultural imagery is unmistakable. 
The locusts and the drought prevented any harvesting, renewed harvest of plenty now after repentance. For the nations, harvest time means that they are ripe for judgment. Wickedness is great. The, the, the sin of the Amorites is full, if you remember the Genesis 15-16 passage. The, the word of sickle occurs all through the book of Revelation, 14, 19, and so on. Ripe, blood will splash to the horse's bridles. That's apparently like five feet high. And uh, for over 200 miles, 176 miles precisely is the distance from Megiddo to Basra. And uh, you go through these passages... In Zechariah 14.12, there's a passage that some people feel describes a neutron bomb, and it seems to, and yet it might be something just a byproduct of what's going on here. Throughout the scriptures, reaping is a, met, a symbol or a metaphor for salvation. Thus, the reaping results in the salvation of the sheep Gentiles. And it's also found in Revelation 14. The treading results in the destruction of the anti-Semites. This treading taking place just outside the walls of Jerusalem is also described in Revelation 14 in the later passage. The, 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 the reaping is described in verses 14 to 16 in Revelation 14. The treading is described in verses 17 to 20. And it's, it's, uh, there's an a, a issue of denotation here that may be uh, very different than is commonly thought of. This judgment of the Gentiles is described... Uh, uh, in Joel, of course, is the very same judgment that is described in Matthew 25, the judgment of the sheep and the goats. And uh, let's continue, verse 14. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. Now here's another term that is, occurs here. Multitudes, hama, it, it means making a loud noise or tumult, like crowds on crowds is perhaps a good, good translation. And uh, this might be a scenario of Daniel 11. It might be something else. It's, it, uh, it, is it drawn by demonic spirits? That's what Revelation 16 would suggest. In any case, what we're seeing here may be uh, Satan's final shot. But this, this uh, valley of decision thing is widely misunderstood. It may, it's often, the, that phrase is used in terms of the believer making a decision. It's the Lord's time to decide, not theirs. He's decided to, this is, the, the, enough's enough, in other words. And, uh, Haras's decision, it means sharpen or cut. It, render a judgment is really what is implied here. And uh, the word thrashing, winnowing, and separation are equivalent terms used in Isaiah 41 and, and elsewhere. And, uh, and even in Ruth 3, we have the thrashing floor seen there, idiomatic of the tribulation period. A lot of word play going on in here. Uh, the noun can also mean that which is dug out or excavated like a moat in Daniel 9.25. And thus a deep valley, fulfillment of Genesis 12, first three verses perhaps. The sun and the moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Very frequently used idiom here. These cosmic signs uh, that accompany uh, uh, the locusts back in chapter 1 are now on a more universal scale. We find the same expression used in Matthew 24 by the Lord himself in verse 29 there. Mark 13, verses 24 and 25. And it's the same kind of thing we... Uh, hear about in Revelation 6 verses 12 through 13. This judgment is to be distinguished from that is held before the white throne which is at the end of a thousand years. Don't get those confused. And many, many people do. Don't. Uh, verse 16. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth shall shake and uh, but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. And uh, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. The Lord will roar out of Zion. And we get this, the Lion of the tribe of Judah idiom used in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5. An er earthquake follows that shakes the entire earth and its foundations and even sets the heavens tottering, apparently. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her any more. This is an echo of Zechariah 12.10. For thousands of years, the Jews have heard the tramping of foreign boots through their holy city. Babylonians, Greeks, Romans, Arabs, Crusaders, the UN, what have you. And uh, so this is a, a very welcome sound 
no more foreigners. Now let's talk the difference between foreigners and strangers. Czar has a stronger meaning than stranger. For Ger are always welcome because Israelites were strangers in Egypt. Ger uh, is a friendly stranger. Czar is a foreigner. It's a stronger meaning than stranger. A stranger could participate in the blessings of the Sabbath and so forth, in contrast to foreigners who sought to wrest the land from God's people and enjoy its benefits for themselves. So the foreigners is a, an adversarial term. And uh, it's even possible for Israelites themselves to become aliens, zarim, within their own nation by following after pagan cults. Then they become foreigners in the negative sense. God hates wickedness in all its forms. They call it the holy city, but not until God dwells in the midst. Zechariah 14 makes that emphasis. The, Canaanite, uh, 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 the Canaanites, are, it's also a term for merchants, and the Canaanite merchant will be excluded as he is from the temple precincts. And uh, we don't see foreigners in public office there either, but I won't start on that right now. Messianic kingdom is going to be a land well watered. Huh? There will be a special millennial river. We get that also in uh, the last part of uh, 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 number 18. And when you read Ezekiel, the last nine chapters of Ezekiel, especially this comes up in Ezekiel chapter 47, 12 verses about there's going to be a river that comes out of the temple, flows through some splits in two directions, and uh, it's all described there, surprisingly detailed. There'll be a desolation of Egypt and Edom, which of course is southern Jordan, but maybe much more than that. I'll come to that in a minute. The desolation of Egypt is limited to only 40 years, by the way. The first 40 years of the Messianic kingdom. But Edom will be desolate throughout the thousand years of the Messianic kingdom. And that's in Ezekiel 29. I want to talk a little more about that. It's interesting. Egypt symbolizes the world, and it is desolate for 40 years. But then it has uh, some good things coming. Edom is a very special uh, situation that I want to talk more about. But in any case, verse 20 of this passage, will, Israel will live in security. Israel will experience a national salvation in verse 21. That's the climax of the chapter. But let's take a look at verse 18. It shall come to pass in that day that the mountain shall drop down new wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters, and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord, and shall water the valley of Shittim. The valley of Shittim is on the east side of the Jordan River. Wow. I see that, that river is going to flow in both directions. It's going to flow to the east and the west. Now, the, these blessings will exceed the splendor of David and Solomon. In terms of borders, you can find those borders in Genesis 15, verse 38. When you speak of the West Bank, you can ask the person, which river did you have in mind? Because it's not the Jordan that's the boundary, it's the Euphrates. Big deal. And... Uh, there's a 34 square mile section set aside for the priests, the Levites, the temple. That's all diagrammed for you in our commentary on Ezekiel 48. And so uh, uh, you want to dig into that. The Mount of Olives, Je Zechariah tells us, will be split like the Araba, like a big uh, 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 um, fault through there. The rift from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. Wow, is the, is the, the uh, uh, rift of Araba. And... Uh, this is going to be the site of the fourth temple, the, the millennial temple, the one that we believe is described in the last nine chapters of Ezekiel. And uh, that's where his throne will be. It's not just a temple. We use the term temple, but it's also going to be a palace. And the floor plan is laid out in detail. It's worth your study. The Shekinah departed from the temple back in Ezekiel 10 and so on. It will now descend through the east gate, according to Ezekiel 43. People ask, why are there sacrifices? All these sacrifices are talked about. For the same reason we had sacrifices in the Old Testament. They were nothing, no one was, um, none of those sacrifices paid for their sins. It was just a memorial in anticipation of the payment that was made at the cross. And so they were memorials in advance in the Old Testament. And there will be memorials after the fact in the New Testament. And this is all described in the Epistle of the Hebrews, chapter 9, especially verse 12. See, none of the Old Testament were efficacious. They were representative. They were prophetic is the point. And so you want to read the Epistle of Hebrews, chapters 9 and 10, which goes into all of that. 
And so these, in the future, are also soon to be memorial or in instructive. And uh, Now the covenant with Israel includes promises regarding the land, Jacob's blessings for Jude and so forth. That's all in Genesis 49, among other places. And uh, the water from the house in Jerusalem is in Ezekiel 47, as I've mentioned. It's also alluded to in, in uh, Zechariah 14.8. The Feast of Tabernacles will be worshipped globally. Zechariah will discover that all the nations will observe the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll also discover that, uh, you know, that Luke even makes, the book, in the Gospel of Luke, we have mention of the church leadership over the Gentile cities. We know the apostles will, the twelve apostles will rule over the twelve tribes. That's in both Matthew 19 and Luke 22. And the word shittim is a, is a Hebrew term for acacia trees, and the same term for the burning bush, the tabernacle, and so forth. So the valley of shittim may be just a, an allusion to, to these goings on. It's, a, it's on the border between Moab and Israel beyond the Jordan. It's the last place that Israel camped east of the Jordan before entering the land of Canaan. It's known for its dryness, but now it's going to be well watered is the point he's making here. The curse is lifted for every creature on the planet Earth except for the serpent, by the way. That's an interesting twist you may want to dig into. Egypt shall be a desolation. Okay, that's what we've been talking about. Now we have another thing. And Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. And that's by way of contrast to the previous verse. So Egypt, let's talk about it first. Je from Jacob's descent into Goshen until today, Egypt has cast a long shadow over Israel's history. Pharaoh Necho killed King Josiah at Megiddo. He invaded Judah. He proved to be a false ally in Isaiah 36 and so on. Egypt will be downtrodden and subdued by the Antichrist, Dan tells us. Yet, she will experience restoration. Five major cities will speak the language of Canaan and be committed to the Lord of hosts. And Isaiah 19 deals with that. Egypt will be called my people. Get that. Egypt will be called my people. Assyria, the work of my hands, while Israel is declared the inheritance of the Lord. In Isaiah 19, he paints a very positive picture for both Egypt and Assyria, the two initial empires in the region. Assyria was first, Egypt later. <coughs> later. Egypt will be a desolation, Egypt shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. Now I want to switch. You notice we've talked about Egypt. Now we're going to talk about Edom, and Edom deserves special study. Uh, this is all, uh, this is, I want to talk about the Olam Eba, the everlasting hatred. This is, the, the Edom brings to for here a, a uh, bitterness, a hate that started in the womb. It's a continuing enigma to this very day. The everlasting hatred started in the womb and now continues to drive events throughout our entire world, even today. The judgment against this protagonist is mentioned more uh, in the Old Testament books than against any other foreign nation. So we want to pay attention here. And yet, very few observers can point to who it represents today. I want to challenge you that, to understand who is Edom in contemporary terms, because it's such a central figure in the biblical text. Let's go back to Genesis 25. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Isaac begot Isaac, uh, Abraham begot Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to, uh, to wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padan Aram, and the sister to Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children, more than one, two of them, the children struggled together within her. And she said, if it be so, why am I thus? She went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said unto her, two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. And when her days were to be delivered, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. And his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. And the boys grew. And Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. 
Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Now, when you get to the book of Romans, Paul comments on this in chapter 9. He says, For the children not being yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. And as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Wow. Now let's go back here to Genesis 25. And Jacob sawed pottage. And Esau came from the field and was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with the same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at a point to die. What profit shall this birthright do to me? Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus, here's the point, Esau despised his birthright. That's the key point here. The coveted covenant, Sarah over Hagar, Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, that's all emphasized in the book of Genesis, deserves very careful study. If you look at the descendants of uh, Abraham, under Sarah, of course, he had Isaac. Under Hagar, he has Ishmael, and Ishmael, Ishmael will also have 12 sons. And then later, Keturah, and he has six sons there that become the, the people that we associate with uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, the Bedouins and so forth. The point is, under Isaac, we have two then, the twins, Esau and Jacob. And Esau, deliberately to offend his parents, marries, contrary to their wishes, a daughter of, Ishmael, of, uh, of the Ishmaelites. Thus, the, uh, that's in Genesis 26, the descendants of Esau get commingled with the descendants of Ishmael and Zimran, both Hagar and Keturah. They all get uh, commingled because they, they weren't called to stay separate. It's an important issue here. So Edom really means red. The name comes from Esau reading red. It's the name of the land occupied by Esau's descendants, formerly the land of Seir. You hear Mount Seir is also an uh, expression there. It stretched from Wadi Zarad in the Gulf of Aqaba, extending to both sides of the Arabah, the Great Depression connecting the Dead Sea to the Red Sea. Now Esau had already occupied Edom when Jacob returns from Haran, and there's a big reunion and all that, and they would seem to have buried the hatchet, but not really. Edom refused Israel's passage by the king's highway. When they're in the wilderness wanderings, he forces, Edom forces them to go around. He wouldn't get, let them go through, and that's a, that's a big deal. When the king of Edom refused to allow the children of Israel to pass through his land on the way to Canaan, they detoured around the country because of his show of force and because God ordered them to do so rather than wage war. They weren't supposed to w wage war because they were brothers. That brotherhood is going to confuse the Romans. We'll get to that in a minute. So a little summary of Old Testament history. Israel was forbidden to abhor the Edomite brother in Deuteronomy. Balaam predicted the conquest of Edom in Numbers 24. Joshua was allotted the territory of Judah up to the borders of Edom, but did not encroach on their lands in Joshua 15. 200 years later, King Saul was fighting the Edomites. David, though, finally conquers Edom and puts garrisons throughout the land. Solomon built the port of Isian Geber. So the story isn't over yet, though. In Jehoshaphat's time, Edomites joined the Ammonites and Moabites in a raid on Judah, but the Allies fell to fighting one another, so it didn't, that sounds like today, too. Under Jehoram, Edom rebelled, but he could not reduce them to subjection. Edom had a respite for about 40 years. Amaziah later inv 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 er, invaded Edom, slew 10,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt, captured Salem of their capital, and sent 10,000 more to their deaths by casting them from the top of Selah. Uzziah, Amaziah's successor, restored the port at Elath, but under Ahaz, when Judah was being attacked by Kepeka and Risen, the Edomites invaded Judah, carried off captives. All through the history, Edomites are, on the, are adver, adver, ad, uh, uh, adversaries or helping their adversaries. 
And Judah never then, from that point on, ever regained, uh, uh, recovered Edom. But we get to a very key point in history, the destruction of Jerusalem. Time is 586 B.C. The t place is Jerusalem itself. The event is the destruction by the Babylonian armies. They're surrounding them. We see the angry soldiers as they wreck the walls and they slay the people and burn the city. But we see something else. We see a group of neighboring citizens as they stand on the other side and encourage the Babylonians to ruin the city. Raise it, raise it. That means burn it down. They're calling, dash the little children against the stones and wipe out the Jews, is what they're singing. Now, when you get to Psalm 137, you're a little shocked, unless you know the background. Because the psalmist there says, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art to be destroyed, happy shall he be that rewardeth thee, as thou hast served us. Sh happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. And that's the way the psalm ends. If that's all you know, you wonder, what, on earth, what kind of a psalm is that? And it's really an echo of retribution for the way they were treated during the Babylonian captivity. Or when it was taken. So, raise it. Make bare is what the word really means. Well, there's a, something that's very misleading. I want to correct you. Most of you have in your Bible maps, you know where Jerusalem is and Hebron and the south and Negev and all that. We have up in the north, uh, just uh, 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 east of the uh, Sea of Galilee, we have the, the uh, uh, heights of Bashan. Today we call it the Golan Heights. Below that we have the Amorites, then we have Moab, and then you have Edom. And the Amorites, Moab, and Edom on all your maps, and so therefore, most people think that Edom refers to that area of geography because they don't know their history of subsequent. I'll come to that. In that region, of course, is Petra, and of course, that is very prominent in the end times. But to the east, southeast of Edom are the Nabataeans. These came out of Saudi Arabia. And the Nabataeans... Um, uh, migrate out of Arabia, and they drove the Edomites westward. And uh, directly west of Edom were established routes of passage. The land to the west was much more prosperous and resourceful than the land of Edom, which was on fertile deserts and very dry, jagged mountains and what have you. And so the land also was in the hands of a family association because Esau with Jacob, if you will. So the land was being vacated because the Jews are being exported to captivity. So we've got the Edomites are being pressured by the Nabataeans to move. So they do move, and they move into the area. They, let me show you this on a map. The Nabataeans are pushing Edom to the west. To the west is really a really good land. So the Edomites establish themselves south of Jerusalem and take over Hebron. And uh, that becomes a region that will show on Ro Roman maps as the nation of Idumea. That's the Greek term for the Edomites. Many people don't realize that Edom had a, a, a country, not the one that shows on your map, but subsequently over here in, in, in better, uh, more fertile ground called Idumea. Now, See, at the Babylonian captivity, the Edomites seized on the Amalekite territory so that the Idumea became to mean the region between the Arabah and the Mediterranean. Hebron, 19 miles south of Jerusalem, was their new frontier. In fact, made it their capital. It's about 3,400 feet above sea level. So unlike Jerusalem, it was left intact as prime real estate. Jerusalem was being destroyed by the Babylonians. The Edomites were free to take over uh, Hebron. Under the Greek Empire, they, under the abuses of Antiochus Epiphanes, there was a rebellion under the Maccabees. And they threw off the yoke of the Greek Empire that ushers in a period of time called the Hasmoneans. So it's after the Old Testament period. It's before the New Testament period. There's a period there of, of the Hasmoneans. Hebron remained under Edomite control until Judaeus Maccabus retook the city under Jewish control in about 164 B.C. 38 years later, in 126 B.C., they had to be reconquered, and they were, by a Jewish army 
under the prince and high priest by the name of John Hyrcanus. He was, he was, he was the, uh, the, the top leader during that period of the Hasmoneans. But something occurs that most people don't notice or pay attention to. When John Hyrcanus reconquers Hebron and, the, and Idumea, he forces them, the Edomites, to either die, flee, or convert to Judaism. So we, all, we, we know a lot about how Jews were forced to convert to Christianity under the Spanish, uh, in the Spanish Inquisition and all that. What many people don't realize is that when the Jews were in control of that area, they forced the Edomites, who theoretically were their brothers, to, into Judaism under penalty of death. That's in 1 Maccabees, and it's also detailed by Josephus. I'm mentioning that because you won't understand subsequent history unless you understand that the Edomites were forced to become, uh, uh, forced into Judaism. Key point to remember. About 47 BC now, Julius Caesar promotes Idumean Antipater as the procurator of Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. By 47 BC, after Pompey and all that, they, they got control of the area. So they appoint someone that they think is Jewish in charge. Because to them, Idumean, Jewish, they're too, they're, they're, that's a family squabble. See, so they, an Idumean to the Roman mind is perfect, is an acceptable Jew, so to speak. So they appoint Antipater as procurator over Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. And by the time you get to 10 years later, the Romans name Herod, the son of Antipater, as king over Israel. His, his mother, by the way, was an Abitian. The Idumeans, Idumean is just, that's a Greek term for Edomite, had five centuries of prior history in Israel by the time that Jesus makes his appearance. The everlasting hatred is still operative. The struggle between Esau and Jacob runs all through the Bible. The Herods of the New Testament were Edomites. To a non-Jew, they looked like a part Jew. But to the Jews, they hated the Edomites, and the Edomites hated the Jews. One of the Herods killed the Jewish babies in his attempt to destroy Christ in Matthew 2. Another Herod murdered John the Baptist. Another one killed James, the brother of John. And the struggle between the Israelis and the Arabs today is but a continuation of this same battle that started in Genesis 25. There's more to it than that. At the time of the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, there was civil turmoil among the zealots, the Idumeans, the Orthodox Jews, even among themselves, they're fighting. 20,000 of Idumean infantry slaughtered many of the Orthodox Jews. That's not a surprise. Many fought with the Jews against the Romans. That is a surprise. Many were killed, sold into slavery, or enjoined among the 40,000 set free by Caesar. <coughs> by Caesar. 40,000 were set free by Caesar. Interesting. So now, you get the, uh, we have, when you get to about 135 B.C., you've got Bar Kokhba has a big, he has about 200,000 men at his command, and he recaptured Jerusalem and had a whole rebellion against the Romans. Bar Kokhba, the Bar Kokhba revolt. Emperor Hadrian called legion after legion to crush the Jewish insurgents. Over 580,000 lost their lives, and Hadrian purpose to stamp out Jewish nationalism entirely. Traditions such as circumcision, the Sabbath, reading the Torah, was forbidden under penalty of death. He was serious about it. Now, what they wanted to do is name the land under, uh, 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 as, uh, in terms of the Jews' worst enemy. Well, the Romans had two choices in their mind. Idumea was their enemy, and Philistia was their other enemy, the Philistines. And uh, Idumea, though, in the Jewish mind, remembering that uh, while many of them fought against the Jews, some fought with the Jews in the recent uh, uh, unpleasantness. <laughs> so they look at Idumeans as a near Jew, is the point. So when they look for a name for the land, they pick Philistia, because that was something they could understand. The Idumeans were viewed as practitioners of Judaism, not, a, not as great an enemy as were the Philistines. And so there are many today, to this day, who claim to be Jews but are not. And the book of Revelation, in chapter 2, verse 9, and chapter 3, verse 9, makes mention, Jesus makes mention 
of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are actually of the synagogue of Satan. Wow. We need to understand who the Edomites are. We look at maps up until 135 AD after the Bar Kokhba revolt, they still displayed Idumea. And after the Romans chose to name the land Pal Philistia, in effect, Palestina in the Latin, Idumea disappears from future maps in history. The Edomites, later known as Idumeans, became assimilated into the Palestinians of today, among other places. Many of the more powerful families intermingle the, uh, 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 with the Greeks and then the Romans as, as, as the power moves on. When you get to uh, Ezekiel chapters 25 through 32, he deals with the judgment on the nations. Ammon, Moab, Edom, Philistia, Tyre, Sidon, and Egypt are the seven. All of them are Muslims. But the one about which the Bible says the most is Edom. Judgment against it. The judgment against Edom is mentioned in more Old Testament books than is against any other foreign nation. In Isaiah 11 and 34 and 63, Jeremiah 9, 25, 49, and so on. Ezekiel 25 and 35. Amos 1, Amos 9. In fact, Amos 9 is quoted by James in Acts 15. Obadiah, the whole book, is focusing on the judgment against Edom. And I encourage you when you study that to get even more serious about really understanding the background of Edom and perhaps most usefully find out who you believe are Edomites to this day. Malachi 1.4 and of course Joel 3.19, that's what introduced this little insert was verse 19. Edom shall be a desolate wilderness for the violence against the children of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. That's all about Edom. Let's continue though, verse 20. But Judah shall dwell forever. And Jerusalem, from generation to generation. And that's all through the scripture. Paul makes a big thing of that in Romans 11 and so on. When God establishes his kingdom, none will ever destroy it. So it's also promised in Daniel 7. At that time, the Lord Jesus Christ will sit on his throne to fulfill the promise to David of an everlasting dynasty. And that too is also all through the scripture. His rule is going to be global. His rule is going to be absolute. That's what the rod of iron idiom deals with. It'll be righteous and just. It'll be, it'll be characterized by holiness and universal peace. Praise God. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed. For the Lord dwelleth in Zion. So the Lord's actually going to wipe away the blood guilt of the nations in their persecution of God's people. And that's a, a term there to be free from the oath or obligation. And after, and after I have judged the nations, I will be free from my obligation concerning the blood of Judah. In other words, that, whole, that promise will be fulfilled. Yorevav here, Yahweh, or however you want to pronounce it, dwells in Zion, the eternal covenant between Israel and the Lord, all detailed in Revelation chapter 21. So, okay, we've gone through all this. What do we do now? What is, what's up to us to do? Well, number one, just watch and wait. But be spiritually ready because the turbulence is on our horizon. A lot of this is going to start unfolding before us. We, need, we won't understand it unless you know your Bible. So you, what you want to do is just watch and wait. Be spiritually ready. Jesus in Luke 19 said, Occupy until I come. He will call his servants to give an account. You say you're saved. Praise God. You'll be given, asked to give an accounting of your fruit bearing. He will call his servants to give an account. You can't earn your salvation. Jesus paid for that. He, that, that your, the situation of your sin is a done deal. It was nailed on a cross 2,000 years ago. But your response to that will be something you'll give account to. So what you want to do is exploit every spiritual opportunity. It's required of stewards to be faithful. It's interesting that every day that goes by that Jesus doesn't gather his church yet is another day for you and me, to, that, for us to be able to improve our report cards. That's really what it's all about. So for your next session, we've done, we've looked, uh, as the Spirit leads you, undertake what, where He leads you, but you might consider to continue studying the minor prophets. We list them in a slightly different order. We can scratch off Joel, we've just gone through that. We've got Hosea and Amos to the northern kingdom, and the parallels between the northern kingdom 
and America are astonishing. Nineveh, of course, is the, the pagan nation that repented and got an extra century, a very important uh, study to do. If you're going to focus on the southern kingdom, which is the centerpiece, of course, Joel, we've done. Micah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk are key ones. Obadiah really is uh, uh, classified, classified in that area, but it really focuses on the judgment coming on Edom. And, of course, after the exile, the return to the land, we have Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. You might want to get those 12 under your belt and understand them. Uh, they're small little bite-sized pieces can contrast to what we call the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Major only in the sense that they're bigger. But uh, with that, let's you and I close, stand for a closing word of prayer.